Um, today, we're going to have a slightly different uh, type of service. We're going to be commemorating the 100th anniversary of the end of the First World War, the Armistice, otherwise known as the Great War. And I think it's really fitting that we do commemorate that uh, piece here, given that the Aspen Chapel was formerly known as the Prince of Peace. The war came to an end when the armistice was signed in a railway carriage in the forest of Campaign on this day, November the 11th, at 11 a.m. 1918. That's on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. And today we're going to look back at that war, what those who fought in it went through, and what lessons there are for us today. I'm going to begin with a poem by Wilfred Owen, one of the poets who himself died on November the 4th, 1918, one week before the war ended, dying at the age of 25. Anthem for Doomed Youth by Wilfred Owen. What passing bells for these who die as cattle? Only the monstrous anger of the guns, only the stuttering rifles' rapid rattle can patter out their hasty orisons. No mockeries now for them, no prayers, nor bells, nor any voice of mourning save the choirs the shrill, demented choirs of wailing shells and bugles calling for them from sad shires. What candles may be held to speed them all? Not in the hands of boys, but in their eyes shall shine the holy glimmers of goodbyes. The pallor of girls' brows shall be their pall, their flowers the tenderness of patient minds, and each slow dusk a drawing down of blinds. I always think that's an amazing line in that hymn. Time like an ever-rolling stream bears all who breathe away. And in the un-PC version, the original version, it it was time like an ever-rolling stream bears all its sons away. And that was written in 1719 by Isaac Watts. And it's just so evocative of the Great War. More than nine million soldiers, nine million soldiers died in the Great War. That represents 13% of the 70 million or so personnel that were mobilized. 117,000 American troops died and 200,000 were wounded. So what we're going to do now is just want to give you a bit of an idea of the scenery, what went on, how it, how it was for those. So we're going to show a, a short film just to give you an idea about what the Great War uh, was like because this uh, gradually comes down. Lieutenant Colonel John McCrae, a Canadian physician and poet, wrote this poem on May 3rd, 1915, after presiding over the funeral of a friend and fellow soldier, Alex Helmer. McCrae was dissatisfied with the poem and discarded it, but fellow soldiers retrieved it, and it was first published on December 8th in the London magazine Punch. It has been described as being, quote, almost an exact description of the scene in front of us. The damage done to the landscape in Flanders greatly increased the lime content in the soil, leaving the poppy as one of the few plants to grow in the region. In Flanders Fields by John McRae. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we loved, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders' fields. 
Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold on high. If ye break, a, with, if ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders' fields. It always brings to mind that famous quote uh, from George Santayana, the philosopher. Those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And it just so strikes a chord here. This was supposed to be the war to end all wars. And yet all of us can list off so many wars that have happened since this one, including, of course, the Second World War. And, you know, it makes me ask myself, what is it going to take for us to realize that war is simply not an appropriate response to the problems of world politics? I have a hope that war will someday go the same way as slavery. You know, we've not completely abolished slavery yet. And its impact is still felt around the world. And yet there's a general understanding that slavery slavery is an anathema in the modern world. And I hope that one day we'll be able to look back at war in the same way. Something that was used in the past, but is an anathema to us now in the modern world. But I wonder what it will take to make that happen. It's something that seemingly everybody wants, and yet war comes around time and time again. If you look at the lessons of the First World War, one of them is that if you're not magnanimous in victory, your actions will come back to haunt you. And it's often said that the harsh conditions imposed on Germany after the First World War laid the seeds for the rise of Hitler and the beginning of the Second World War. And so we have to look at our responsibility in the creation of the conditions that lead to war. That great quote from Lao Tzu in the Tao Te Ching, the master thinks of his enemy as the shadow that he himself casts. The master thinks of his enemy as the shadow that he himself casts. If a nation is centered in the Tao, if it nourishes its own people and doesn't meddle in the affairs of others, it will be a light to all nations in the world. His enemy as the shadow that he himself casts. Often we we create the very thing that we have to fight. I come from a soldiering family. My grandfather, General Sir Ivo Lucius Beresford Vesey, fought in the, he fought in the Boer, this is the unlucky generation, he fought in the Boer War, the First World War, and the Second World War. My grandfather, the other grandfather, Brigadier General Wilfred Algernon Ebsworth, fought and was badly wounded in the trenches. My father was in Africa in the First World War and was wounded there. My uncle and my mother were both in military intelligence. And I went to Wellington College, which is a school for the sons of army officers and to create more officers. However, something must have gone wrong because here I am. (laughs) I'm not in the army. (laughs) What's it going to take for us to get the point that war is not considered an option? Well, obviously, it's all about the evolution of consciousness. Now, in most Sunday schools that you go to in churches around the world, you can bet your life to any question that the Sunday school teacher will ask, the answer will be Jesus. You can't go wrong if you just give that answer. And here, 
in the Aspen Chapel, pretty much the answer to any question that I might ask is always, the answer is always the evolution of consciousness. And really, you know, the thing is that here I think it is the answer. If you look at the way that society has developed, it's all about a, a gradual understanding that such and such is the right way and such and such is not the right way. And you can look at the growth of understanding around race, around gender, around slavery, around education, around health. And throughout history, there's been a, a growing awareness as civilization develops. There's been an evolution of the social consciousness as to what the right way of behaving is. And we gradually become to understand what's right. This collective consciousness, this becoming aware of our responsibilities to a greater community. You know, when a community is identified in terms of family, ethnicity, country, or any other partial construct, there's always the possibility of conflict. When a community identifies itself in terms of family, ethnicity, country, or any partial construct, there's always the possibility of conflict. But when a community is experienced as a whole, there is no need for conflict. After the First World War, the victors wanted to punish the vanquished. And the Second World War came along because of that. For war to be abolished, we have to be willing to experience our community as the world. We have to experience our community as the world, that every nation is a part of that community. And that for one part to succeed, we all succeed. And for one part to fail, we all fail. In fact, the community is actually even bigger than that. In reality, the universe is our community. And to experience ourselves as a part of that whole is truly the beginning of peace in our world. That's not to say there won't be arguments and negotiations, just that killing over these arguments and negotiations will not be seen as a part of a civilized society. And we have that today, you know, in most of our nations. In most of our nations, the rule of law exists. People work around that as they negotiate their way through life. And, you know, killing does happen, as we saw only tragically um, this week. But it is the subject of the sanction of law. And so it has to be for the real world, for the whole world, in order for there to be real peace. It has to exist within that sanction of law. That old quote from Einstein, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created that problem in the first place. No problem can be solved by the same level of consciousness that created the problem in the first place. And I think for war to be eradicated, there has to be a shift in consciousness. And that shift is the ability to identify with everyone as being a part of our community. That famous question the guru was asked, how do you look after others? And the answer he gave was, there are no others. There are no others. And that's why our work here at the Prince of Peace is so important. It's an attempt to live at that level of consciousness and to develop our ability to communicate that level of consciousness to others. On a lar larger level, it is the evolution of consciousness because in reality, that level of peace that we're talking about and that we seek is embedded in the order in the universe. That level of peace, that level of order is embedded at the deepest level of the universe. We live the idea here that there is a higher power, there is a greater wisdom, there is an ordering principle, you know, God if you like, that's calling us to recognize the intrinsic ordering power of love. We are called to recognize the intrinsic ordering power of love. You know, love your enemies. Love those who persecute you, as Jesus said. All of creation is calling us to live in love, if we could but hear it. 
But that call is drowned out by our minds that want revenge and punishment, that see our needs and wants as more important than the needs and wants of others. We are being called beyond that. And, and, you know, I think it is possible. But it'll take a shift in consciousness that's appearing at a grassroots level to trickle up to both the voters and the leaders of the world's nations. And that's the way it has to go. It has to go, not the other way around. We think, oh, let's get all the leaders changed. No, you get the leaders you deserve because we vote for them. And it has to trickle up through the voters to the leaders. It will happen. The only question is whether or not it'll be done voluntarily, that uniting as a, as a community, it will happen. But will it be done voluntarily or will it be done as a rep response to some global catastrophe like, you know, an alien invasion or a meteor strike or a huge weather event? At some point, we are going to realize it because we'll have to. I always think it's interesting in Star Trek, that great purveyor of enlightenment of wisdom, <laughs> although they battle the Klingons and the Borg, back here on Earth is all peace and agreement, if you look. The Federation and the Earth within it are at peace with each other. We just have aliens to worry about, which, let's face it, is a step forward. <laughs> if not universal unity of consciousness. But um, today we're remembering a world where, you know, this event, the, the, the Great War, the First World War, you know, it has scarred us forever. And the Second World War has, but we're looking at this now. It scarred us forever, an event that took nine million lives. We remember the fact that these people were caught up in this catastrophe. And it's our responsibility to try and make sure that it doesn't happen on our watch. You know, pass the torch, as it was said in that poem. It doesn't happen on our watch. I want to finish. You know, some of you know Bill... Van Stoken, a member of our community here, and he, he sent me this morning an email. And um, he said, thinking of this anniversary, this is Bill, caused me to think of a story of my grandfather, William, told me. He said that as a 21-year-old private from Minnesota, he told me, that's Bill, of being loaded onto a troop ship that left New York Harbor early in the morning. As an infantryman going into the Great War, he suffered no illusion about what awaited him at the end of his journey. But just after just a few hours at sea, he felt the ship begin to change course. And soon the soldiers learnt that while at sea that morning at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, the armistice had been signed. The events of that day, 100 years ago, exactly, Bill says, allow me to grow up experiencing the influence and example of a kind and humble and strong and grateful man. And you know, if that ship hadn't turned around, if the armistice hadn't been signed, both Bill and his daughter, Noe, who goes to our Sunday school, would probably not be here today. Do you know, there's a, I'm coming to the end of this bit. There's a marvellous poem called For the Fallen by Lawrence Binion. And in England, we use it to remember the war dead and to lead us into a silence uh, that is then broken by a bugler. So we use this, uh, this poem to lead us into a minute silence that's broken by a bugler. And it goes like this. One verse goes, they shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. And then after that line, everybody repeats the line, we will remember them. That's right.
So what we're going to do now is we're going to stand and I'm going to say those lines. And after we will remember them, we'll have a minute's silence just to remember all those who fought. And it'll be broken by a bugler. So let's stand. And the words are on your service sheet. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. And, you know, I think that really perfectly illustrates that shift in consciousness. Not that our country is anything less. I vow to thee, my country, all earthly things above, entire and whole and perfect, the service of my love, the love that asks no questions, the love that stands the test, that lays upon the altar the dearest and the best, the love that never falters, that love that pays the price, that love that makes undaunted the final sacrifice. And then it goes on just to talk about something further. And there is another country I've heard of long ago, most dear to them that love her, most great to them that know. We may not count her armies, we may not see her king, her fortress is a faithful heart, her pride is suffering, and soul by soul and silently her shining bounds increase, and her ways are ways of gentleness, and all her paths are peace. The idea of a greater idea than just what we want for ourselves and for our own. And Heather's just going to come and read just that famous reading now from Isaiah. It's from Isaiah chapter 2. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. 
He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war any more. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Thank you. And if you have any, any thought about prophecy, there is, a prof- there is a prophecy that is waiting to come about. And it's there written down, and we hold on to that, each generation. And it's our turn, really, to hold on to that. We're going to have our offertory now. I'll just pass the plate round. Um, uh, we're going to hear some lovely music uh, while you do that. And uh, please do... Just give generously so that we can continue the work that we do. Thank you. Just thank you for your generosity. I think it takes intention to move to that next level of consciousness. And I like to use this litany for peace just to remind us of what's at stake. I'm just going to read it through myself before we do it. So it's always difficult when you're reading something just to read it off straight. You don't know what's coming next. Uh, So I'm just going to read it first of all myself. In this time of war, we acknowledge the love of the Great Spirit. In the face of stupidity, we ask for wisdom. In the presence of death, we celebrate life. O Lord, in the midst of doubt and fear, we affirm your living love. In pain and in grief and in sorrow, we ask your blessing on the world. 
In the knowledge of your great goodness, help those who cannot help themselves. Great Spirit, we give ourselves and our world into your hands. Inspire us into the way of peace. So let's stand uh, to say this. Let's stand. And your words are the words in heavy type. In this time of war, we in the face of stupidity, in the presence of death, we celebrate life. O Lord, in the midst of doubt and fear, we affirm in pain and in grief and in sorrow, In the knowledge of your great goodness, great spirit, we give ourselves and our world into your hands. And we say together, as those who were in the great war said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Would you please sit? Like those other poems, I think it's important to hear the words of those that suffered and their complaint at where they were led and how they were led. And this still applies today. This short poem by Siegfried Sassoon, who fought in the war and survived, dying in 1967 at the age of one. It's called The General. Good morning, good morning, the general, he said, when we, lo- when we met him last week on our way to the line. Now the soldiers he smiled at are, m- are most of them dead, and we are cursing his staff, the incompetent swine. He's a cheery old card, grunted Harry to Jack, as they slogged up to Arras with rifle and pack, but he murdered them both with his plan of attack. <laughs> 